you guys don't mind, we'll go ahead and get started. Sure. All right. So my name is Noah Bedome. Uh, I'm a penetration tester and lead social engineer at Coal Fire Labs, Coal Fire Systems. Um, before I get started, just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in InfoSec probably for about a year with some IT experience before that. And this talk is basically a culmination of um, all the lessons that I learned and the things that I saw coming up in the InfoSec community as far as what pertains to social engineering, primarily verbal based social engineering like pretext calling, verbal interactions, that kind of stuff. So forward, basically what this says is that there's some really bad mindsets out there and some misconceptions that are um, being perceived. So things that people are saying that this is what social engineering is when it's not really very accurate. Things like social engineering is telling a good lie or social engineering is making a good um, counterfeit or facsimile when really social engineering is um, getting someone or influencing someone's actions in such a way that is in line with your goals and hopefully in line with their own internal nature because they'll be make it easier to do, right? Something that's in line that goes against someone's own uh, core nature is really hard to do. But, I mean, that's something that some people attempt to do sometimes. But with this, the whole idea is you want to be inciting an internal, legitimate, emotional reaction in line with the person's nature and your own goals. So the little quip at the end I keep using is if you take someone to the river, tell them to jump in. You can tell them that there's a screaming baby in there or whatever. If they don't want to jump in the river, they're not going to. If you take them to the river and set them on fire, there's a legitimate reaction that they're not going to be in control of. They're going to jump in the water because they want, don't want to be on fire, right? So you want to incite an internal, legitimate, emotional reaction. That's just kind of my view on social engineering and how to do it effectively. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at bad social engineering, at least what I've seen, just from talking to other social engineers, um, talking to clients who have had bad social engineers, um, and also lessons I learned when I was a bad social engineer. All right? So they're going to split the talk into really two sections. Um, what the bad social engineering look like, looks like. We're going to break it down into observations, fallacies, uh, process it, the process of bad social engineering, and a little summary slide, and then we're going to move into, because I don't think it's right to tell you what's messed up and not give you at least some ideas of how I think we should fix it. Um, then we're going to talk about some positive techniques, I think, that could really help a lot of people. I've taught these techniques to some of the other guys in the field with me, and they've helped them, and they've worked for me. So um, it's just generated from my own personal experience. All right, so, so observations, right? So there's a lot of check-in-the-box assessments. People who want social engineering because banking um, compliance regulates you have to have a social engineering test, or you have to do this or that. And they don't really want to fail. They don't really want real results. What they want is, I got a test, right? And so there's a lot of um, firms and stuff that are tailoring their assessments to be, we're just going to get it done. We don't really care if it's effective. We don't really care if it builds a really strong um, material base for them to use to make training. We're just going to get it done. Um, there's not a lot of available materials that are really good for training unless you go and really dig and hunt for them. I know when I started to learn to social engineer, um, one of the really things that I found was you know, socialengineer.org, and then there was a couple other like vague things that were out there, and there's a lot more coming out since, but still the material is kind of, most of it is, here's my war story, or here's a bunch of stuff, go do some research on your own, because you have to figure it out for yourself. And I know there's a lot of people trying to fix that situation, but it still makes it really hard for people who are expected to do this as a job function, and don't really know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, some training can be really expensive. Um, there is affordable training out there, but um, a lot of, Training is really expensive, and so because security is a cost center, a lot of people don't want to send, say, okay, we're going to send you to, you know, X thousand dollar training for five days and lose you from productivity and from, and lose funds. So it makes it kind of hard. Um, also, so the bad assessments generate bad material. So we give these clients these social engineering assessments, say, Here, here's what I did, and it's written badly, it's got bad content, it's not really done very well. And then they're expected to build their training information awareness systems off of this. That's not really fair to the client. It's not really fair to the environment. What it does is generate just a really bad um, overall, uh, basically, meta, meta environment for social engineers to be successful and to help uh, information awareness training be successful. So fallacies, uh, these are things that a lot of people believe that, in my opinion, aren't true. You don't need to be a good liar to be a social engineer. I mean, it can help sometimes. Um, the target doesn't necessarily need to believe you. It goes back to what I was talking about, instigating a um, legitimate emotional reaction internally. 
Because if they feel like they want to do something, it really doesn't matter what's coming out of your mouth, as long as you make them feel the way they want to, the way you want them to do. Um, and then, uh, just like I said, you don't need to be a good liar to be a social engineer. So this is kind of what the bad process looks like. Bad process looks like we got improper target selection, right? Part of um, something I was always told when I was a Marine is don't pick any fight you don't think you can win, right? So when you have target selection, you need to pick your target. You need to pick a way you're going to approach your target in such a way that applies to that target, right? Um, and so we just go through the process. All of these are pretty flawed. Inadequate research and um, preparation, really cookie cutter scenarios that are applied, just blanket to anything and not really adapted. Usually sometimes based because people reciting them are uncomfortable. Um, ungraceful information requests, hey, give me your password. Uh, absence of a, really forming a real relationship with your target. Uh, rigid interactions, no plan B, um, poor exit method. And this one is the big one to me, no lessons learned. Sure, you can mess up a social engineering engagement. You can mess up anything in life. You need to be able to step back and say, or take someone else with you and say, How do, what did I do wrong? How can I do better? What am I going to do to do better next time? What kind of training am I going to do? Right, and so this is to me the biggest issue with social engineering period right now is that a lot of social engineers are too self-centered. They believe that it's all about how good I am, how good of a liar I am, how good of a social engineer I am, but really it's about, it's like a marriage. It's about the relationship you're establishing with your target, right? So how are you taking care of and influencing the emotional state, the trust state, the rapport with your target? It's not about how good you're lying, how good you look, how good your makeup is. It's about how well you're doing with your target. And so if we just take the focus away, I mean, the focus still needs to be on excellence, but we need to take the focus away from how good am I to how well am I influencing someone else? So we talked about what's bad. I know I'm kind of moving through it because we've got 50 minutes and there's kind of a lot of content, but I want to make sure I get it out there for people so we can start, people can start thinking about it. Um, so we talked about what's bad, so how do we do better? I think the basis of how to do better is you have to have a good foundation. And I think, in my opinion, uh, one of the best foundations for this is the OODA loop. So uh, John Boyd was a fighter pilot and he came up with what's called the Boyd cycle or the OODA loop. So I, basically what this is is some he developed for fighter pilots to help them take a, a cognitive process, break it down to understandable, um, notable phases, and be able to control their movement through those phases so that they control the reactions of their targets. The idea is you observe a situation, you orient yourself to how you interact, how you fit into that specific situation, you decide on a course of action, and then you act. Whether that this course of action or action is not doing anything, it's important that you made the conscious decision to do it. Now, this sounds kind of clunky, right? I'm, okay, so I'm observing, I'm orienting. Now, that's how it starts, but what you do, and like from Marine Corps training, what you do is you start slow, right? Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Start by practicing interactions with other people, going to a coffee shop, just chatting up conversation, and going through these cognitively. Okay, I'm observing, I'm orienting, and over time it becomes smooth, it becomes reflexive, it becomes something that you can control, and then what you can do is use that to rapidly analyze content, stimuli within your conversation, your interaction with other people, and be able to say, okay, well, I'm gonna do this to try to get them to do this. Okay, that didn't work, now I can quickly react and move it to this kind of scenario. So that gives you get basically some extra tool sets, some added reflexiveness in these conversations that because a human conversation is very dynamic, um, everything's changing very rapidly, you need to be able to react quickly and you need to be able to analyze input quickly and that's why this skill set's very important to learn and get good at. Um, so preparation. For any social engineering engagement, preparation is key. So know your goals, know your targets, know yourself. Right, I'm gonna just kind of go through these two slides real quick. So know your goals, you need to know what you're looking for, why you're looking for it, right? What you're trying to do, why you're trying to execute it, are you trying to get passwords, that kind of thing. Know your target, right? You need to know who you're targeting. Is it a bank? Is it an individual person? What kind of information are you targeting? Who has that information? Why are we targeting them, right? And then finally, what, one of the things I think is very important is know yourself, right? So here's two kind of cliche quotes is uh, the obligatory Sun Tzu quote, which is know, your, know thyself, know thy enemy, a thousand battles, a thousand victories. If you know yourself, you can set yourself up for success. Hey, I'm not good at a British accent, I probably shouldn't pretend I'm British, right? Uh, I'm very good at this, I should probably decide to do that, right? Um, and then the Tyler Durden quote, how do you know anything about yourself unless you've been in a fight? 
idea is how do you know how you're a social engineer, what you're good at when you're not, if you haven't practiced, if you haven't trained, if you haven't tried. So that's, those things are very important to do. So now we're, we're through kind of the beginning stuff and we're into tricks. So the kind of my tricks, the tricks of my trade, the things that I've taught to other people to help them be successful. Um, so there are things I use in uh, interactions, verbal interactions mostly. So we got commonalities, um, we got details, emotional injection, uh, universal yes and no questions, the rip, and the warm fuzzy. So uh, commonalities, these are things that you can use to almost instantly establish a rapport relationship with your target. So things like shared per hardships, um, shared benefits, life exp experiences, um, personal background, environment, that kind of thing. You can take these things like uh, I had a situation where I looked up the weather in a location, I did a pretext call, I brought up that I had issue with the snow in the morning, they did two, and immediately we were best friends. You know, and it worked very well because we both had to, you know, I had to make something up a little bit, but we both had to go through and put our snow tires on, the car, we almost got in a wreck, we flipped around on the freeway, you know. We had those things in common together. And so because of that, it's immediately we established what's called a com uh, community relationship, right? We are now part of a little micro community with each other within that conversation, and that helps rapport. Uh, so details, these are things that kind of go towards the lie side of it where you're trying to add uh, legitimacy just to avoid detection, right? Things like um, badge numbers, last for your social security, or getting them to validate their own, which makes them feel like they validated you. Um, recent events, explanations. One I really like is combined attacks. If you do a phishing attack, you notice that you weren't successful on the target, but you did get them to click on a link. Well, now you can say, well, I'm the IT guy, and you clicked on a link, looks like your system's infected, we need to do some troubleshooting, right? So those are all things you can add those details in to give basically your pretext, your interaction a little more meat and things you can fall back on. So emotional injection. Emotional injection is um, very similar to like uh, um, neuro-linguistic programming, which is essentially you're trying to inject an emotion, or you're trying to inject an action or a thought into somebody. And you can do so basically by feeding them stimuli and using the loop to rapidly analyze the response. You can figure out how this guy responds to different stimuli. You know, if it's a girl at the bar, you tell a story and they giggle, it's a positive response. So at that point, you can start uh, crafting stimuli to inject specific emotions. And that goes into learning your target in the conversation, which is why the OODA loop is important. Uh, universal yes no questions. This is, I'm phrasing a question in such a way that the answer is, you know, 95%, you're gonna say yes or no. Did you read the, the user agreement? Did you read your employee manual? Um, did you click on that malicious link? You know, like, these are all things that people are naturally gonna have responses that they're gonna say, whether or not they're true, which leads us into um, the RIP. So RIP is reactionary identity preservation. This idea that people like to be who other people think they are, and they wanna be that. Even if they're a liar, they really don't like it if everyone thinks they're a liar, because they wanna be, they think that they're honest, even though everybody's a liar, right? So it comes down to that if you can put them in a situation where they're, they have to take actions to defend that identity, you can basically navigate them into the direction that you want combined with that emotional injection. Things like universal yes or no question. You ask them if they read the employee handbook. Okay, now they have to, now if they say yes, at this point, other, unless they want to show themselves as a liar, they have to actually act like they read the employee handbook. Well, on page 12 it says you need to give me your password. I know that's kind of dumbed down, but essentially, you know, things like that. Okay, well, then let's go ahead and go with that. Um, so I think it's really important with, is to remember that basic psychological principles apply very strongly to um, social engineering and that someone's identity is very important to who they are. You know, that's the core, right? That's what most psychology is about, is about people's interaction with their own identity. So you direct that, manipulate that, influence that, then that can work very strongly to your advantage. And then the warm fuzzy. Um, when you walk away, just like with training, you should always walk away feeling your target or your person you're training should feel like they won, right? They should feel like, a, like they succeeded. No one should ever feel like a failure when they leave a training ground. No one should ever feel like a failure when they leave your call because it's gonna help you avoid detection and also um, you might have to deal with them later. Um, also, you can maybe maintain that access and use that actually to leverage it again. All right, so, so anatomy of interaction. So we're gonna talk about basically going from this, meets the nice nurse, starts talking her up to, well, the picture speaks for itself, right? So anatomy of interaction, we're gonna initiate, we're gonna go through the pleasantries phase, establish a pretext, inject emotion, team up, uh, request information, and then we'll go through our closing.
So initiate, this is basically starting the call, right? You need to have done your research and you need to immediately start it up and try to establish those, that rapport, that commonality, the community relationship, right? Using those commonalities you speak, spoke of, details, um, things like that, reverse um, validation, getting them, please read off your last four so I can validate to the document, make sure I'm talking to the right person, those kind of things. Uh, pleasantry, so at this point, we try to establish a very distinct either lack or presence of pleasantry. Okay, this is gonna help create that relationship that we're trying to establish and we're gonna try to inject emotion through, right? If we're starting as the, <laughs> if we're starting as the enforcer, the pleasantry needs to be distinctly absent in the beginning and then we can add the pleasantry later to try to sit, add kind of a redemption method to our conversation to give them a chance to get out of the problem they're in and become their friend, kind of team up with them and move on, right? So it's very important to know whether your pleasantry needs to be pleasant, or present or absent here. You know, what is the conversation, what is the emotional interaction you're trying to establish? So establishing a pretext. At this point, this is where a pretext, I'm an IT guy, I'm this, I'm, uh, I'm here for this, we're, I wanna ask you a question about this. This is where we establish our pretext and where we continue to try to build that rapport um, and we explain the background of what we're doing in, in such a way that hopefully gets them to buy into it. So now emotional ejection. So we've established kind of a superficial relationship and hopefully a community relationship with that. So now we're gonna to try to inject emotion through that avenue of that relationship. Think of it like a VPN and we're sending packets downrange, right? So now we're trying to say, okay, what kind of emotions am I trying to elicit? What kind of reactions am I trying to get? And subtly probing, trying to figure out exactly what kind of person this is, what kind of identity they have, and how I can influence it. Right, and that's where the OODA loop comes in because then I can analyze that input and make snap decisions how I'm gonna react to it. All right, so team up. At this point, so people don't like being alone. This is a common thing. There are, you know, introverts and stuff, but at a basic biological level, we are a community species. So the thing is, when we feel alone, separated from the herd, as it were, we start to become defensive. Um, a lot of people do that. I mean, a lot of males are used to that. Okay, I'm alone, I'm, I'm on my own, I'm the big tough guy. But the thing is, if you can team someone up with a, either another person, an idea, or a mode of thought, something like that, hey, we're gonna do this. Hey, I'm gonna be with you, now we're gonna go through and work this out. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk you through how to change your password to one, two, three. You know, we're gonna team up and be uh, a real team with that person. It makes them feel less alone, more likely to be compliant, right? So, Whenever possible, it's good to try to attach them to either a goal, an idea, or a person. Uh, request action, so this is when we say, need your password, can I get in the door, those kind of things. It should be in the context of the relationship you've established, and it should be in line with the emotions you've been trying to influence, all right? It should also usually provide a reward, benefit, um, something that's important to your target. All right, so uh, the warm fuzzy, this is the end, this is saying, Hey, we're gonna reinforce this person. We're gonna say, hey, you did great. Hey, thanks for all the help. Uh, we're gonna give warnings if, if necessary. Well, hey, please don't talk about this to anyone else for the, you know, a little bit. We're conducting a security investigation. Really don't want that to be messed up by our interaction. You know, goodbye, hey, have a nice day, be polite. And smoothly exit, even if you didn't get credentials or access. Smoothly exit because that'll give um, less idea that, or less suspicion, an idea of suspicion. Uh, and then, so, pwned, right? So we got, if we got it, we got it. If we didn't, we do our lessons learned and we move on. So recap, we talked about the OODA loop, talked about preparation, we talked about tricks, uh, we talked about interaction phases, and then we went through uh, the bad things about social engineering, at least that I've seen. Um, I know I moved through a little rapidly, you know, 50 minutes is a long time, and there is a lot of questions attached to a lot of the things I was talking about. Um, I'm available for those, um, any questions, for me or for about the practice and what we do or whatever, uh, my director's here with me. So if you guys have any questions, I'll open up the floor now. Yep. Sure. So um, what I was talking about, well, I guess I'll just not go back. But so what I was talking about before, the RIP, so reactionary identity preservation. So like I was saying, people uh, really attach a lot of validity to their identity. Most psychology, most normal psychology, pins on who that person believes they are, um, what values are important to them, those kind of things. And when you take that and say that your identity is in, um, is threatened, they start to react in specific ways to defend their identity. For instance, um, if you accuse someone of being a liar, they usually very quickly say, I'm not a liar, or things like that, right? But now if you, so if you ask them, did you read the employee handbook, like I said before, they say, yeah, sure, I read the employee handbook. 
Well, do you remember what it said about uh, password policy on page 12? Oh yeah, yeah, I think I glanced over it. Okay, so now I can now feed you what was on page 12, All right? Because you defended your identity because you initially answered a yes or no, uh, universal yes or no question the way I wanted you to, which locked you into a course of action. Now, you either have to say, hey, I didn't read it, I lied to you, compromise your own identity, or you have to play along with this course of action. And that can be extended to a lot of things. Um, are you this person's friend? You know, or you, they're gonna act, they're gonna have to act and be in that friend relationship if they tell you they are, right? Even if they're two-faced or they're doing something behind that person's back. And you can use that to navigate those actions in the context of the relationship. Good question, thank you. Oh, I guess I didn't repeat the, converse, the question, if you guys can hear. Uh, the question was examples of the RIP, the reactionary identity preservation. Sure. So the, the question was, what to do if you start to lose the interaction that you're establishing? And I think that's why I was saying the OODA loops are important. So there are some situations that are going to go sideways, and there's sometimes there's nothing, it's out of your control, right? There, there are things out of our control. However, if you've been really taking the time to establish that community relationship, you've been looking at what's going on there, you can usually figure out, well, what step do I have to take backwards? Where do I have to go one square back to say, okay, so this person didn't like I asked for their password. Okay, can I take a step back? Say, hey, that's fine. We can go ahead and put a ticket to IT. Let me go ahead and verify some other information. Like, let's go ahead and do a couple other things. Just make sure things are set up, and then I'll put the ticket into to the, for a password change for IT or for uh, further follow-on action. And you can redirect it. You might not get a password. You might not get the information you wanted, but you might be able to use that now as a reconnaissance. Okay, so how is this composed? What kind of operating system are they using? All right. The important thing is to remember that passwords aren't the only thing to do. It's really good to approach things as tactical questioning. If you're not able to get a password, or you're not able to get a social security number or whatever, what can you get that's gonna build either on your experience, gonna build on the information you gather, or what's gonna help you create additional attacks? Did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, doing a lot of scenarios actually, pre-dex calling and also impersonal social engineering. Um, and then, you know, I'll be honest, I use a lot of these things uh, when I, you know, in interactions, let's say, you know, with clients too. Because the thing is, you get clients that are, get upset about, you know, you got to, let's say, I do pen testing as well, and I found a pretty critical finding, but they weren't very happy about me finding that finding, because it's going to mean, you know, delay on the rock or those kind of things. At that time, you can use these interactions to um, make those situations a little more favorable so that you can make sure that the client gets his goals met and doesn't get blinded by frustration at the situation, and that you can make sure your goal's met by executing the operation. Um, but for the most part, pretext calling is really common just because, you know, travel's hard to do sometimes, and you can do a lot of really strong social engineering over the phone, but I'm a bigger fan of in person. Uh, Sure, so the question was like, how do we select a target? What kind of target selection do we do? Um, sometimes it's dependent on what kind of scope the client's provided. S client said, might say, I just want you to only call this guy or these people, right? Then you don't really have a selection, but you can select what order you do them in, right? If you target a manager first, there's you know, a good chance that, that if it fails, there's gonna be a lot of alarms raised, right? If you target a lower subordinate first, so you, you know, to get a lay of the land, um, there's a good chance that if they did give you the password, they might not initially come forward because they may be afraid of repercussion initially. So, you know, there's, there's things there, um, but with when I have the opportunity to select targets, um, I do do people reconnaissance, do a lot of, you can do a lot through um, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, advanced Google operators, you know, Google hacking, find out a lot about people. Um, you can also do probing calls, so necessarily, as long as you get permission to, obviously, in scope of the engagement, calling briefly and saying, Oh, hi, I was just wondering, you know, what I need to do to set up an account or whatever. You can just kind of get an idea of how things run on a very general non-pen test uh, idea, and then you can use that to build, okay, well, I see this kind of uh, process going on in um, customer support. But I see this kind of process going on when I come in and say I have a problem with my computer, you know, or whatnot. And so at that point, you can really establish what department, 
what kind of people you're looking for. Also, you know, if you're one of those guys who's more comfortable speaking to women, um, you might want to select you know, a female target first. But if you're one of those guys who's really good at establishing that man-to-man, uh, -man, macho relationship where you're both on a team and you're going to go get the bad guy, you know, whatever you want to do, you might want to take that approach first. Um, I think it's good to kind of pick success, your highest success rates first, because failure can sometimes mean that the alarm goes off. Right? And then when a bunch of emails go out and stuff and cops get called or whatnot, then, then it's kind of over at that point. You want to avoid detection as long as possible. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> yes, sir. What do you mean by plan B? Plan B. Okay, so kind of what I was talking about with Dave back there is that when, uh, when things go wrong, when something there is an issue, you should have an alternative. You should have a very good exit strategy. You should also have, um, well, I'm not going to get a password. If I'm not going to get this, what am I going to do? Am I just going to make a friendship with this person and maybe then I can reattack them later? I'm going to make a friendship with this person and maybe get myself directed somewhere else I want to be. Um, what, how am I going to do, what am I going to do here to preserve and make this a valuable time spent? Because within a scope of any engagement, you have a certain amount of time you're allowed to spend and you want to make sure you use it all to the value of the client and the value of the people that you're going to hopefully be help training and improving their skills later on. So anything you can do to get value out, that should be your plan B. Okay, I wasn't able to get a password, but what can I do here? Can I get you reconnaissance, those kind of things? Sir? Now, uh, when, when I do body language, when I'm in, in person, you know, majority of my call, my um, social engineering is pretexting. Um, but when I do body language, it's, uh, I think, you know, Chris actually talked about it pretty in depth the other day, is that, you know, you really need to think about injecting these emotional, this emotional injection, you know, what are you projecting? If you're trying to give, get sympathy out of a target, if you're trying to inject sympathy, you should not be the full masculine, I'm coming at you full force, here I am, you know, I shouldn't be doing my, my macho marine thing, right? I should be a little more relaxed. I should be, um, I should actually seem like I deserve some sympathy. You know, my shoulders should be a little further down. I should put myself in a little less um, dominant position, those kind of things. Um, I think it's really important. Um, it's like, it's an entire another talk, but I think it's really important to never just ignore body language or ignore verbal. You really have to have a melding of the two. Um, I see a lot less errors though um, lately in uh, body language because people kind of know how they want to feel if they practice ahead of time. A lot of people have issues stumbling when they're talking. Uh, a lot of people have issues really figuring out how to adapt to conversation, you know. So at least that's what I've seen. Sir? Do you use the um, When doing fishing, um, I, I tend to, but usually outside of fishing, I uh, usually just do a lot of manual reconnaissance. Um, I don't really like using like um, like Google, well, you know, like a lot of the, the Google bots and those kind of things that do a lot of your uh, reconnaissance. I mean, sometimes you have to, but um, they tend to lately they tend to get you, you know, black flagged when you for Google and you have to type in the captcha and all that stuff. So I do a lot of my reconnaissance and all my other stuff manually. But I do love the set for fishing and for payloads. You know, just doing like um, reverse shell stuff because it really interacts really well with you know, the Metasploit framework and all that. So. Anything else? All right, hey, oh, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about that in targets that we use the most, not only targets that we carry out uh, social engineering but engagement. Sure. Is your approach really to like, just like start at the top or for your best fit? Is it like target bottom approach or do you have other strategies? Uh, I think it's, it's really dependent on the goals and on the specific situation. So the question, like you said, was, um, how we do, how we basically move through target sequence. When we have a target selection list, do we start at the top and just call every single person? Um, it really goes back to what kind of scenario we're doing, um, what, kind of inf what kind of organization we're targeting. If we're targeting a specific um, scenario that we want to stretch over a long period of time that we think will be much more effective, if we can build a pretext and continue it and then inject something through a long built relationship, great. And then we're going to do it much slower. It's going to take a lot more time. We're going to do one person at a time over a long period of time. If we're doing, hey, we want to see what it, in a simulated carpet bomb, you know, exactly what we're going to do. So go through and just hit everyone as fast as possible. Try to get past that alarm going off. I mean, on occasion, that's why I would do it based on time scope and the expectations of the client. 
Um, but I try to establish that in the chartering and scoping calls. Sir. Sure. So there's a lot of really like great uh, formal courses out there. Um, I mean, obviously they have price attached, but most of them are um, completely worth the amount of money that you're paying on the training. They're usually intensive, several days. Um, they cover a lot, broad spectrum of stuff, and they really help develop a real foundation skill set in people who go through them. Um, problem with those kind of paid courses is, first off, you know, companies have selected training amounts. Also, the random guy trying to get into social engineering doesn't always have X amount of money to drop on, you know, training, those kind of things. So that's what you run into. There isn't a lot of um, do-it-yourself training that I've seen. Um, there are some pretty good books, um, but you gotta be careful because some of the books are war stories. Just, hey, here's what I did. Here's what this other guy did. They don't want to say how they did it because they don't want to incriminate themselves or incriminate anyone else. Um, but there are some pretty good texts out there without endorsing one. Um, for me, I learned mostly from research, from watching videos of courses that were done or videos of people who teach courses and they're doing talks and little snippets and then reading through as much material as I could. Um, in the end, you kind of have to just take it and look at what really applies to you and just try to absorb as much information as you can. My big focus is on applying psychology. Um, I, was, I was originally gonna be a psych major before I joined the Marine Corps, and so I had a lot of information and uh, interest in psychology overall, especially humanistic psychology, so I really like to focus on people, what makes people tick. So that's one of those things that you really have to kinda figure out what's gonna work for you, but like the answer to that as far as courses, yeah, there are some really good courses out there. If you just Google social engineering courses, um, those kind of things you'll find out. I think they had one here, right? You guys, Chris, you guys ran one this week, right? So um, I think, Chris, you're tied into a lot of other people teach classes as well. So if you talk to Chris, he probably got some better answers for you on that than I do. Uh, anyone else? <laughs> one more. <laughs> okay, so maybe my second social engineering engagement of all time. Uh, actually, it was a very successful engagement overall, uh, but I got one guy, and I, I call him Insanity Wolf, uh, for people who know the meme, the meme, because I got Insanity Wolfed. I, I called him up, and I started the interaction nice and smooth. Hey, I'm doing incident response, and he was nice and, you know, he was friendly to me, and then in the middle of it, he goes quiet and says, I'm going to find you and kill you, and I... I did not know what to do. <laughs> you know, it's my second time ever doing social engineering. I'm like, I've, I've done nothing but read material for like three weeks. I was not prepared for that, right? He's like, I'm gonna, then he goes on, I'm gonna find you and I'm gonna beat you to death. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, hold on a second. So I started to say, hey, this is a, this is a training assessment, you know, I'm trying to figure out what He's like, no, you're calling the wrong company. We are not that company. I'm like, uh-oh. You know, but he was, he was getting me. You know, he was like, he was telling me misinformation to put me off kilter. And at this point, I'm like emailing my boss. My wife is in the other room. Like, are you okay? You know? <laughs> so that was probably the worst one. Um, that overall engagement was really, really successful. I got a lot of credentials, but that one made it all feel kind of like a loss. And so I had to go back and really look at how I was initiating interaction. Because something I did in that conversation made that guy want to kill me. <laughs> and I hadn't even asked for a password yet. So... Um, but when I found out that guy was apparently former CIA and, and did counterintelligence, so like, I, I don't know, that one was one I definitely I reflect on pretty often. Anybody else? All right, hey, um, I wanna say uh, thanks a lot. I also like to give a round of applause for all the really good talks that we've had before me. There's some pretty awesome people speaking, so if you guys give a round of applause for those, and um, thanks a lot for coming here. Uh, if anyone has any more questions or anything, I'll be around, so.